Dios mío. Se jodió la cosa entera. Life happens, right? Maybe we'll get to see it after. Uh, oh, wait, you have to turn this off. You can't have both of them on, right? Hello? Está bien. Okay, so I just found out that your very first conference was held in 1975, which is, wow, that's amazing. And that it was first held in the 70s doesn't surprise me at all. The 70s culture seemed to bring out a more mindful generation, by and large, which was open to newer thinking and revolutionary, revolutionary ideas. Yeah. It was also the decade of pet rocks <laughs> and mood rings and water beds and swag lamps and beanbag chairs, but it was also the genesis of women's rights, environmentalism, nuclear awareness, and the ending of an unjust war. The 70s was loaded with portent. For me, the 70s offered a new twist in my career a chance to be a part of a brilliant experiment using television to teach children to read and write. My colleagues warned me. My actor friend said, a children's show, what are you, crazy? Don't do it. You'll never work as an adult again. An adult teen. Well, that's how it was then. And it was a risky thing to do, but you know what? I listened to my inner voice and I did say yes to the PBS series, The Electric Company. I had no idea that I loved children so much until I had one, Fernanda Luisa. I still remember when my husband Lenny put our little girl, Fernandita, in my arms for the first time, and I turned into an absolutely fierce I remember holding her in my arms with hot tears in my eyes and saying loud enough for anyone in that room in the hospital to hear, if anyone, and I was saying this to her with all my heart, if anyone ever dares to harm you, I will kill them. <laughs> my own mother's love and care for me were at once highlighted and underscored when I could see through this lens of maternity and motherhood. Let me go back a little bit. When I was five years old, I'm in Puerto Rico, the place of my birth. My mom packed up all our belongings in a trunk <clears throat> and two shopping bags, which I've always called poor people's suitcases. And she put us on a ship called the SS Carabobo for a journey to a mysterious place called Nueva York. Carabobo. Most of you in this room knows what that means. <laughs> it means stupid face. So let's just say that a boat with a name like that is not a good omen. <laughs> Mommy's plan for a better life in America did not start out so well. You know, sometimes our best laid plans end up on the floor of God's very large editing room. Almost as soon as we disembarked, no, as we embarked, we hit a violent storm that threw everyone on that boat into a state of collective panic. Now, Latino people have many, many natural, wonderful talents, but one area in which we particularly excel is panicking. <laughs> ah, yes. When it comes to panicking, we are the envy of the world. <laughs> it is part of our world view. We are profoundly passionate people, pathologically passionate. <laughs> Everything in excess, nothing in moderation. Where other cultures believe in restraint and self-control, we believe in the principle of constant combustibility. <laughs> when in doubt, flip out. <laughs> when 
I said that if anybody harmed that baby, I wanted to kill them. That's part of that. So by the time we finally arrived in the safe haven of the New York Harbor, we were as verde as that enormous green lady shooting straight up from the middle of the ocean to the very top of the sky, wearing, I thought, some kind of crown on her head like a princess and holding a huge, what looked like an ice cream cone. <laughs> I distinctly remember tugging on my mommy's dress and asking, Mommy, oh, Mommy, ¿quién es esa señora tan grande? And my mommy tells me that esa señora is a very special lady, that she's inviting everyone from around the world to come to America, to come and live here, to come and be citizens of los Estados Unidos, especialmente people who are pobres, cansados, hambrientos sin hogar, poor, tired, hungry, and homeless. We are definitely overqualified. <laughs> but when I look up at that big green lady's face, all I can think of is, seems to be coming rather soon. Quien sabe, quimo sabe. That lady's invitation and her welcome for me was way too brief, because all of a sudden I found myself caught up in a reverse Wizard of Oz. The lush beauty and warmth of my tropical island had been exchanged for the grit It was the first time I had ever seen trees without leaves, and I wondered what was going on. And that's when my mother introduced me to a thing called Medicaid. The sights were unsettling, but the sounds were even worse. The friendly squawks of the neighborhood parrots where I live in Puerto Rico were replaced by screaming sirens. And the chirping of the tati, a little tiny native frog, who speaks its own name in Toki, Toki, that was lost to the glare of a thousand foghorns. But most unsettling of all, human voices speaking in sounds that I did not begin to understand. Now, I was smart as a whip. My grandfather, Justino, who we left back in Puerto Rico, could tell you, why, esta niña, esta niña, genial. She can name all of the trees by the shape of the leaves. And I can sing and dance and entertain him as he thumps time on the kitchen table. He cheers me on, he affirms me. But here, here, in this place, I don't have my voice. I am nobody, I am nothing. I am reduced to something even When I started venturing outside, it was to go to a big, scary place called Chile, where millions of other kids knew everything that I did not know. And absolutely nobody spoke Spanish, because this was before the Puerto Rican diaspora, before all the Puerto Ricans came to the US. The only way my mommy could get me to, to, to go to school was to drop me off and tell me she was going to buy me un paquet de chicle, nena. Okay, nena? I'll be right back, okay? But it shouldn't be right back. I cried and I thought she had left me forever. Bilingual classrooms, <laughs> they did not exist in those days. And the truth is that as I sat here today listening to these wonderful stories, listening to the wonderful, generous, soulful, big-hearted people who take part in this astonishing program, I really felt for us. How might I tell if my life had been different and I had the kind of help that these lucky, lucky children have now? There was nothing like this. I mean, I was 
kids to roam into school into a kindergarten, he has to want to go to two and learn how to read. Not knowing a word of English, having nobody, nobody to learn with. To this day, I have a lot of trouble with arithmetic. Forget math. Because of the language problem. I did learn one thing, a very important thing, and that was that you have to learn the words. Because without the words, you cannot express your needs or your feelings. And I gotta tell you, I learned it and I learned it fast. And it took time, but I, I began to feel safe in my classroom. Walking home, that was a different story. I ran home from school almost every day. I got a lot of exercise because I never ran in a straight line. I had to crisscross the street every half block to avoid the gangs of kids who owned the sidewalks. I couldn't get to our apartment building soon enough. I ran from side to side to escape the jeers and the name calling. Hey, Spick! Hey, Garlic Melt! Hey! Pierce here, freeze ball. Names whose meanings I really never understood, but I knew by the looks of hatred on their boys' faces that I was attending bilingual 101. The pain of those slurs would haunt me throughout my whole life, my childhood, my youth, and into my adult life. I had run from those taunts, and later, I had run from myself. Rosita Dolores Alderio, the niña who just didn't fit, whose skin was too dark, Diane, and whose hair was too curly. I really wanted to be somebody else, but I wanted to be somebody else. Gabe is so much more than learning a language. You get it. And it's hugely about self-worth, isn't it? Now, I should tell you that my mommy was bilingual, by which I mean that she spoke both English and Spanish at the same time. <laughs> it was no help at all. Do you know what I mean? You know, for years I mistakenly thought that I had no role model, but it wasn't until much later that I would appreciate my mommy's example of hard work, persistence, and a spirit that would not surrender. Somehow those values became deeply embedded in my character and motivated me throughout my life and career to never forget it, never quit. I look back and I see her as a hero. And of course, like all heroes, she had her quirks and her feet of clay. Oh boy, how she could embarrass me. Once when I had a little girl, well, you know, English is a difficult language. So many rules made to be broken. <laughs> Sometimes. When I had a little girlfriend over to play one very, very hot uh, summer afternoon in Manhattan, which is, you know, you feel like you're in a bad year. My mommy is pacing up and down the apartment saying, ay bendito, se abrió. Hace demasiado calor, me voy a morir. It's too hot to do any work today for piss sake. <laughs> so girls, I'll tell you what we are going to do. <laughs> We're going to pack a picnic lunch and have a nice swing at the beach. But before that, girls, you have to help me. We gotta change the shits on the bed. <laughs> Mortified doesn't quite explain it. I wanted to die of embarrassment. My little girlfriend, whose name was Angelina, but my mommy called her Angelina started to snicker, of course. And I took my mommy aside and I said, Mommy, Mommy, bendito sea Dios, Mommy, te ruego. Hey, hey, I love you. <laughs> can't, can't you see the beach? Can't you see the beach? And she said, no. 
no, I can't. And I said, why, mommy? She said, because I got trouble with my bowels. They have it. I thought, well, that's over with, you know, those hard times are over until I met the man I wanted to marry, a nice Jewish doctor. <laughs> Can you imagine how thrilled those families were? <laughs> From the Bronx, you could hear, oi, 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 oi. From the East Side, you could hear, oi, oi, oi. Bendito, me voy a morir. I said to my mom, listen, mommy, we really have to make this. You know, she said, no, you are right. We have to make this. <laughs> no question, she said. So I said, why don't we invite Lenny over here? I want you to meet him because I'm telling you, you're going to fall in love with him. He's really a wonderful guy. She said, okay. So a few weeks later, Lenny shows up at my door. My mom opens the door. She takes one look at him, and she says, Jill, are, are you? <laughs> and poor Lenny says, Jew are you? <laughs> and the poor man was so nervous he actually said, Yes, I am. I <laughs> but you know what? If you read my book, you will find out that we were married 46 years. <laughs> and listen, all of you with Mexican ancestry in the room, don't you laugh at us PRs. Puerto Ricans. Here's a question for you, smart Alex. What do the words July, mushroom, Texas, and chicken have in common? Well, let me use them in a sentence as spoken by a Mexican person. Don't you lie to me. There's no mushroom in the car. So I will wait until she texts me. And see if she can, and see if she can pick me up. <laughs> July mushroom, Texas, and chicken. <laughs> There's one more. I was doing a series with Fran Drescher called uh, "Happily Divorced." Wonderful, good time. And uh, just before we did the show, before an audience, every Friday we would have dinner in the special place of the studio. And uh, the people who served the food were Mexican. The food wasn't always Mexican, but they were Mexican. And one day I'm looking in this steamer thing, and I said, and I called a man over, and I said, excuse me, what, what is this? What's this in here? And he looked at it, he said, I don't know, but I will find out. I said, thank you. So about five minutes later, he goes in the kitchen, comes back five minutes later, he says to me, I said, did you find out what that is? And he says, yes, that's Popeye's. Popeyes. And I'm thinking, what the hell could he possibly? I said, wait a minute. You would mean hot pie, would you? <laughs> and he said, that's what I said, Popeye. <laughs> he was very annoyed with me. The humor in language is really universal. As serious as we have to be about education, we also have to learn to laugh at ourselves. Anyway, so when I was, uh, I was
was married over 40 years to my husband, my only marriage, my kind Jewish doctor. And uh, you can imagine what that, that uh, that was like, because I already described it. I felt so out of place the first time I was invited to eat with his family. I believe it was a Passover. So, you know, it was very proper, very sedate. Well, I had to pay them back, so I invited them over for Christmas. <laughs> it was like a television comedy. First of all, Tanta Shirley comes to the table. I killed myself making a Jewish dinner, and, uh, and it was not, of course, your average Christmas dinner. And uh, Tanta Shirley, Shoyle, comes over to the table, and she says, so? What? No turkey? I killed myself making this Jewish meal. Anyway, we, we absolutely poured Manischewitz down their throat. And before you knew it, we were doing salsa and conga lines. <laughs> Wine will get them every time. So, oh, wait a minute. I had missing pages. What happened? <gasps> Remember when I dropped those pages somewhere? Oh, my God. We have just gone from page 10. Eleven does follow ten. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> being 83 is a real pain in the ass. <laughs> when else can you get applauded for being 83? It's amazing. <laughs> amazing. Anyway, what an exceptional validation that I had made the right decision to be part of that uh, electric company experiment years before. And now, please let me validate you. First of all, let me say that uh, this experience has been, has been way beyond what I ever expected. You people really, this organization really should be blessed. You should be, you should be dipped in cement <laughs> in the nicest possible way. <laughs> okay, let's say brass, like an Oscar. Uh, I am so proud to have been asked to come here and, and help to open this astonishing four days that are going to follow. Um, you know, as I look at each one of you, I am made even more hopeful for tomorrow's students because of your values, because of your efforts, and because of your commitment. Here's the wonderful thing. This is what's so fabulous about this organization. It is you who will provide the doors through which the great What an honor for you, and what a privilege for those children that are safe and blessed. Let's thank Rita Moreno one more time. <laughs> and Rita, we will. Yes, we are. Okay. We also have two books that are gifted to you from our own Alma Flor Ada. And we. I
I think we do have the clip now that we'd like to show. When you look at who's won the Showbiz Grand Slam, you know, the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, and the Tony Award, it's a pretty short list. Audrey Hepburn's done it. Mel Brooks has done it. So has this woman, Rita Moreno, the only Hispanic woman, by the way, to do it. And that's part of her legacy. Rita paved the way for Latin stars. It actually inspired the likes of Jennifer Lopez, who wanted to be Rita when she saw West Side Story. You're walking hot and tired, poor dear. Rita was born in Puerto Rico. At five, she arrived in New York City, didn't speak a word of English, faced racial prejudice, but worked her way up and out of Spanish Harlem. She made a Broadway debut at 13, then started in movies when there really wasn't a Spanish-American actress in Hollywood, so Rita was typecast. She played Latin sex pots, Indian squaws, Mexican dancers, but all of it changed with West Side Story. Rita won an Oscar and vowed not to do any more films that reinforced Latin stereotypes. I am a serious actress and I really want to grow and develop. She didn't do another movie for seven years. Instead, she did six seasons of The Electric Company. Leave one bottle of milk. Right. I don't get that. She won Emmys for roles on The Muppets and Rockford Files and then surprised everyone by playing a tough-talking nun in the hit prison series Oz. Want to run that past me again? Along the way, Rita's received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from George W. Bush, and she does motivational speaking, drawing on her experiences for more than 50 years in Hollywood. Where did you get that clip? Where did you get it? That's not the one he... concludes today's opening general session. Thank you so much for being here. We hope that you enjoy the conference. We also wanted to let you know that unfortunately, both Brian's and Rita's book have sold out, but they will be available to sign their pages in the program. So if you want to get a signature, they'll be doing that after this session. We also want to remind you to join us at night at the exhibits from 6 to 7.30 in the Grand Exhibit Hall. And please, don't miss our Cave reception. Good evening. <laughs>